Hi everyone, my name is Chu. I'm a freshman studying chemistry. When I was younger, I was obsessed with chemical reactions. I pranked my badminton coach by putting table salt in his coke to see if a reaction would happen. And guess what? A reaction did happen, but my coach got mad. In fact, my passion for chemistry continued to grow as I became aware of how these chemical reactions play an important role in people's daily lives, particularly with acids and bases. These reactions can be used to beneficially target the delivery of cancer drugs to particular parts of our body. For instance, chemotherapy. In today's society, most cancer patients are treated with chemotherapy in a one-size-fits-all approach. Usually the side effects outweigh the benefits of the treatment since the drug gets delivered to the whole body instead of our intended tumor sites. Today, we are going to look at different factors to determine the strength of acids and how these factors can be applied in designing peptides that are important to targeting cancer cells. Our first factor, element effect. Remember that the strength of a Bronsted-Lowry acid is measured by how willing the acid molecule is to donate its proton to the solution. So, how can we determine how willing the acid is to do just that? We can figure it out by looking at their conjugate bases. Notice that the conjugate base has a negative charge. If that charge is stable, then the acid will be willing to give up its proton, and it'll be a strong acid. If that charge is unstable, then the acid will not be willing to give up the proton, and it'll be a weak acid. If we look at the two structures, we see that the negative charge is on oxygen and sulfur. But how do we differentiate the two? We look at the periodic table, and we consider the two trends, same rows and same column. If we go from left to right across the periodic table, the acidity increases because of the increase in electronegativity. If we go from top to bottom, the size of our atom increases, which is why we observe the increase in acidity. In this example, we can simply conclude that the negative charge on sulfur is more stable just by looking at the periodic table. Now let's talk about resonance. Since hydrogen is bonded to oxygen in both cases, we can't use the element effect to rule this molecule out. However, there is a critical difference between the two structures. The first one is stabilized by what we called resonance. What does resonance do in terms of stabilizing the negative charge? Imagine that we have a hot potato in our hand, but too hot to hold for too long. If we could grab another potato that is cold and switch potatoes between our hands, we spread out the heat over two potatoes. The same concept applies here. We spread a charge over more than one atom to delocalize to make the molecule more stable. Now let's take a look at our third factor, induction effect. Similar to our resonance example, the proton is bonded to oxygen in both structures. The element effect doesn't help. There's also resonance in both molecules, so resonance doesn't solve the problem. The only difference between the two compounds is the presence of chlorine atoms. Since chlorine is very electronegative, it withdraws the electrons from nearby carbon, making the carbon atom more electron deficient. Because the higher electron deficiency, the structure on the right is more acidic. Let's finish up with our last factor, orbital shape. Before we attempt the example, we must first understand what different orbitals sp3, sp2, and sp mean in terms of stabilization. For instance, when we say sp2, we put together 1s and 2p orbitals, giving us three identical orbitals that are 1 3rd s and 2 3rd p character. Similarly, if we have sp3 orbital, we put 1s and 3p orbitals, giving us 1 4th s and 3 4th p. Comparing sp2 and sp3, sp2 clearly has higher s character, implying that it is lower in energy. If we look at our example, we see that the structure with a double bond has sp2 carbon, and the one on the right has sp3. Because of higher s character, the molecule on the left is lower in energy and more stable. Now you all have mastered how to determine acid strength. We should explore how it is used in synthesizing peptides that are critical in targeting cancer cells. Unlike conventional non-targeted chemotherapy, we attach our peptides that we'll be synthesizing soon to nanoparticles to attract them to highly expressed receptors at the tumor sites. 
Assuming they are loaded with pharmaceutical agents, they can bring these agents into increased vascular areas, where active drugs can eventually be released. Because delivery is targeted, we can use a lower dosage and still kill the cancer cells effectively. Since chemistry isn't fun without demonstration, I will synthesize RGD peptides using solid phase peptide synthesis. For the purpose of our video, I won't go into details about peptide synthesis process. Instead, we will focus on taking away protective groups using different acids and bases. In order to attach our amino acids together, we must take away certain protective groups that are present on each amino acid. There are different kinds of protective groups, ones that come off in acidic solution and others in basic solution. For our peptide, we use TFA to cleave off the resin or to make the peptide cyclic. Let's take a look at the structure of TFA to figure out why we prefer TFA over acetic acid. Remember that fluorine is very electronegative. It withdraws the electrons from nearby carbon, making the carbon atom electron deficient. Can anyone tell what makes TFA a strong acid? You're right. That's exactly the third factor, induction effect. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you learned a lot about acids and bases, but also how they play a major role in creating peptides.